Thank you for the warm welcome, Nutan ma'am. And uh, it's a pleasure to talk on literary theory, which is a kind of a pet topic now with me. I'm going to delve right from the basics and then move on. And it's a difficult task in the sense in one hour I'm trying to encapsulate more than a century's work of numerous people. So what you actually get today would be a bird's eye view. But the request is that whatever you see as names or names of books or essays, try and make a conscious effort at reading them. Because it's not always that you can mind pick somebody else and get to know about theory. And I'm going to put it into a very practical perspective for you. So I'll be screen, uh, sharing the PPT that I have. Do keep your pens ready in hand. If you have questions, note down your questions. We'll take that at the end. So before I actually get into theory, uh, this will be the outline of the entire presentation. I'm actually going to begin with our understanding of criticism and that too in English literature. Now, the word criticism in general, if you see, it means evaluating something, be it literature, be it a work of art, culture, and we look for the positives and the negatives of something. And it's not something that is new in literature. It's been there right since the time Aristotle wrote his poetics. And what we see in British literature is two frameworks. One is the ideas-led criticism, which started with Philip Sidney, and you have John Dryden, Dr. Samuel Johnson, I mean, Samuel Johnson calling John Ryden the father of English criticism. And on the other hand, you have practical criticism which developed with Matthew Arnold and the Touchstone Method, E.S. Eliot's tradition and individual talent, F.R. Lewis. So all these people paid a very close attention to the text. That is how practical criticism developed. Rather than, I mean, they were kind of move, they were the earliest ones to move away from the idea of uh, being or looking at a writer and his life and work. And on the other hand, the ideas related led criticism looked at the structure of the literary work, how it was affecting the readers, what was the nature of the literary language, all that. So our next question would be, was there any theory before the emergence of what we call literary theory. And our answer goes back into history when we go to the 1920s and we have the Cambridge English School with three critics, I.E. Richards with his work on practical criticism published in 1929. And then you have William Empson's Seven Types of Ambiguities and F.R. Lewis who extended close reading method from poetry to novels as well as to other materials. But then what happened at this point of time was that English studies got separated from language studies, historical considerations, philosophical questions. The only idea was to look at a work individually and critique it. And again, it's in the 1960s onwards that we find a attempts to reestablish the connection between literary studies and other fields, be it history, psychology, political science, myths. So coming to theory, what exactly it is? When we have physics, chemistry, maths, we, we talk about theories. Everybody will talk about some theory. So basically, it's an idea to explain certain events or things. And it is rational and it is supposed to be observational. You can observe and you can make comments. Literary theory is that when people started reading literature in a very practical manner, they applied certain methods to it. It is these methods or principles which came under the category of literary theory. And criticism, which was there right from initial times, was influenced by theory. It is not necessary that all critics would be theorists. Okay, this is something that one has to remember. You can be a critic in your own way without being a theorist. And we'll come to what I mean by that. So, 
the transition happened, started happening in the 1960s and it's kind of still going onwards. This is a very brief sketch of how things kind of moved. Not necessarily the dates in such a fixed manner. This is just for our understanding of theory. So before we enter with structuralism as a term, what do you think were the early theorists called? The word that they was later on given to them was liberal humanism. What does liberal mean? Liberal means when you are non-political, you do not take very uh, certain, very strong stances or stance. And humanism means that you are, you basically believe in human nature as something which is constant. You are not a Marxist or you're not a feminist. You are not a psychoanalyst. You are just looking at human nature. So basically, when we are not a theorist, it's simply we say that we are a liberal humanist. And so we are people like, we fall in the same categories as somebody like Ben Johnson, who says that literature is not for an age, but for all times. And literary texts contain meaning within itself. They are not looking outside the text. They are looking at literature. It talks about human nature and that human nature is unchanging. So continuity in literature was more important than innovation. But come to the 19th and 20th century, innovation becomes important. And that is where theory, actually literary theory, differs from literary criticism. And it is with structuralism that we ex Definitely start doing theory. And the basic of structuralism comes from the works of Ferdinand de Sousa in his work called General Linguistics, which was actually made public after his death in 1913. Now, there are certain things that he said, and we kind of, I think you've gone through it. So we'll just recap. One is that all linguistic signs are arbitrary. There is no logical reason between the name we give to a sign. For example, I have a pen here. Why do we call this a pen? There is no rational reason. And the meaning that words have that are all relational. So you have the pen, you have the pencil, you have the sketch pen, you have the crayon. So language does not just record or label our word, but it constitutes our word and it is our mind which gives a meaning to these words. The other part of the theory that he talked of is lang and parole, which later on Chomsky calls as competence and performance. So lang is the principles of language, your knowledge of the rules of language, that is your competence, and parole is the concrete use of the language or your ability to perform, what Chomsky later calls performance. The other term that Suswa talked about is paradigmatic and syntagmatic. Now in paradigmatic means that every term can be substituted. So if you look at the chart over here, article a er can be substituted by the, the can be substituted by a demonstrative like that. If you replace word, even the letters in a word, you are changing meaning. For example, you have a word like cat. You replace the cur sound with a bur sound. It becomes Bat. You replace the burr with a mer, it becomes a mat. With the change in the letter, you are changing the word, and with the change in the word, the meaning is also getting changed. And syntagmatic relationship talks about the relationship within a construction. That is, you have a subject, you have a verb, you have an object. And it also talks about the rules of spelling and grammar. So I cannot say a chair fell in the dog. That would be an unacceptable sentence because it's not logical. And how does logic come? It's our mind which gives us the logic. So if you remember, if you are looking at, a, say, a menu card, you have different names of soups. That would be a paradigmatic relationship. The syntagmatic relationship is that when you're ordering food, start with 
soup and starters and then you order your main course and then you order the dessert. You do not order first the dessert and then the soup and starter and then the main course. So that would be your syntagmatic relationship. Similarly, Suswa also talked about synchronic study and diachronic study. Diachronic study refers to historical linguistics. If you are studying the a change in language over a period of time, that is historical linguistics. For example, how thee and thou became you, or how God be with you became goodbye. But synchronic linguistics is a study of language at a point of time. When you are studying, say, certain dialects. So, in certain parts of Bihar, you have something called as Ol. Uh, the same thing is called as Kucho. So, if you are looking at that kind of a study of words or language, that is a synchronic study. Now, the key assumptions of structuralism is that literature is modeled on the structure of language. It has its own grammar and is a system which can be seen in relation to other systems in culture. We also see how a text constructs meaning. Now, the main thinkers who actually followed the linguistic schools and are categorized as structuralists and have uh, and are parts of different schools are like the Russian formalists of 1920s, like Shlovsky, Bakhtin, Boris Eschenbaum. Then you have the Prague school of Mukravosky and Roman Jacobson. You have a school of semiotics which studied science and texts, documents and advertisements. You have the structural narratologists who gave various models of reading and broke up broke it up into different constituent elements. Uh, each of these theorists have given a theory, have given a concept. I'm just taking up one over here that is ba uh, Slavsky, who had talked about the familiarization. That is, you have something, say I'm talking of the train, uh, of the rickshaw, and somebody says, okay, call a rickshaw. Someone says, call a Three chakra vahan. Now you are thinking for two minutes, what would this three chakra vahan be? So then you realize, okay, three chakra, okay, the three tires, so hence three circular tires, hence it's the rickshaw. So when you have an, an everyday object which is represented differently in order to make you aware of its difference in existence, that is what defamiliarization is. Now, when we come to the structural narratologists, we have, at least these are the three main people, Barthes, Vladimir Prop, and Grimas. Now, Barthes talks about the five codes. One is the pro eretic code that deals with time, the homiletic code, which talks about what happened, why did this thing happen, where did it happen, how did it happen, the cultural code, which deals with common knowledge, which does not require any explanation, semic code, which deals with assumptions and connotations. So we have this connotation that if there is a stepmother, she has to be wicked. We cannot think of a good stepmother as such. Then the symbolic, that is where we have contrasts of good and bad. So you have somebody, you decide that this person is a good person. This student is a good student. That student is a bad student. And that has nothing to do with your uh, marks, the good or bad that comes in with other cases. Similarly, Vladimir Prop studied all the fairy tales that we have and he lists 31 functions. And Grimas came out with six acts. So you have the subject and the object in a text. You have a sender, receiver, a helper, and an, or an opponent. Now, what do the structuralists within literature do? This actually look for parallels, repetitions, contrasts, patterns in plot, structure, character, and language. So you have, uh, if you remember, the opening of uh, Charles Dickens's A Tale of Two Cities. It was the best of times. It was the worst of times. It was the age of reason and it was the age of uh, uh, I forget, it was the age of light and it was the age of darkness. So if you see, it's the structures are kind of repeated. There is a contrast involved. So when a structuralist would study 
he or she would focus on the way the language over there is played out. Then you may have a text uh, where a text begins with a sunrise, it kind of ends with a sunset or begins with another sunrise. So you look at these events, you look at the language, you look at the characters and you try and draw certain parallels or uh, you look for the repetitions and that is how you create the structure of a text and this is what the structuralists actually did and do. We enter the phase of post-structuralism with Bartz's The Death of the Author. Now, if you look at the word over here, post-structuralism, I have not used any hyphen. And this is something I've actually again be talking of when I come to post-colonialism. But the whole idea is that it's not that structuralism ended in a particular year and, or in a particular month and post-structuralism began from the, that point of time. Now, if you've studied, uh, if you remember your physics in school, where we are taught motion, you have, say, you're sitting in a bus and you feel the bus is moving, but then you realize that your bus has not moved. You are still at the same place when you look outside the window. It's probably the bus which was next to your bus that has moved. So it's with this point that if you remember, you do not have access to any fixed landmark. You do not have any standard to measure anything. And that is what post-structuralism is all about. You feel that you are the center, you are moving, and then suddenly you realize that you are actually not moving. You are not at the center. So while structuralism originated from linguistics, post-structuralism originates from philosophy from work of writers like Nietzsche, who says that there are no facts, only interpretations. Whilst in structuralism, the language has a very scientific precision, tone and style of the post-structuralist is a bit emotive as well as flamboyant. For the structuralist, language was reality and it constructed the world. But for the post-structuralist, language is constantly floating free, meaning cannot be guaranteed. And hence, when you look at parts, you read parts, text is connected to all other texts through intertextual relations. And a very basic uh, example of this I would give is like if you are watching the telecast of Mahabharat. Now, within Mahabharat, there are so many stories which form a text in itself. Right. And so one story gets as a text is connected to the other. So you have people referring to Vedas, people referring to Puranas, you have people referring to somebody being given a curse in past life or a boon, boon in the previous life, which is to be used in this life. So all that is intertextuality. And the text is produced, not consumed by the reader. Produced because you interpret it in your own way. My reading of a text will be different from your reading. It will not necessarily be the same. And that is what Barth said, that the death of the author leads to the birth of the reader. And a work is independent. It is not determined by the intention of the writer or the context in which it is written. It's to completely independent. A key figure in structuralism is, apart from Barthes, is Derrida. And he gives us the term deconstruction. So he has three books of grammatology, speech and phenomena, writing and difference. And he questions the notion of centers, unity, identity, and signification. A very basic example of deconstruction that I can actually give you right now on spot would be Thomas Gray's Elegy in a Country Churchyard. The very fact that Gray says that nobody has written about the people who are in the villages lay buried in that particular churchyard. He says that in the text, but the contradiction is that he himself is writing the text. That is what deconstruction 
basically about. You create a structure, you dismantle it with the help of arguments. So if you say that light is better than darkness, how do you realize that light is better? It's only, it can only do when you realize the value of darkness, which means that you cannot, within this binary, you cannot say that light is the only important thing and darkness is not important. The similarly, that happens with truth and false. How do you know truth is a good thing? You know truth is a good thing only if you know false or lies. If you do not know lies, you would not know the value of truth also. So the difference between structuralism and post-structuralism is that while structuralism looks for parallels, balances, reflections, symmetry, post-structuralism looks for contradictions, paradoxes, shifts, conflicts, absences. So I, I can again, uh, I, I don't know whether you read Tess of the Durbervilles by Thomas Hardy or not. So as a structuralist, you would be looking at the various parts the book is divided into, what each part deals with, how things are parallel. But as a post-structuralist, you start questioning certain things. For example, Tess kills Alec with her red knife. Red knives are supposed to be. The blood seeps through the floor and is visible on the ceiling. Once you start questioning these things to show the conflicts or absences, you are entering the domain of post-structuralism. So within a text or in the context of literature, you read the text against itself. You foreground a neglected metaphor or word root. Something has been ignored. You catch a hold of it. You bring it to the forefront. You show that the text lacks unity and language explodes, creating multiple. The next part is psychoanalytic criticism. So it comes from the techniques that were used by the psychologists and in the inter and we use it in the interpretation of literature. The main development goes back to Sigmund Wright and his work where he talks about the mind and he divides it into, to begin with, into the unconscious part and the conscious part. And he says that the unconscious plays a decisive role in our lives. The other thing he talks about is the repression and sublimation. Depression means forgetting or ignoring unresolved conflicts, those unadmitted desires in our mind. And sublimation is that when you make something into a great intense thing, and that especially you can see happening in the cases of uh, religious expressions or longing. Then Freud came out with three levels of personality. He talked of the ego, the superego, and ego. Ego is the conscious part. Superego is our conscience and Eid is the unconscious part. Another theory of uh, Freud that is used a lot in literature is that of the Oedipus complex. Very briefly, the entire concept comes from the play Oedipus Rex. At the time of the birth of Oedipus, it was predicted that he would kill his father and marry his mother. So the child was actually, uh, the father ordered it to be killed. But the ministers, instead of killing the child, they put him in the forest where the king of the neighboring kingdom found the child. He took the child home and the child stayed with him and grew. And when Oedipus grew up, what he did was he attacked the neighboring kingdom. That was his father's kingdom. And in the fight that ensued, he killed his father and he married his mother. So the intense desire of the male child for the mother and of the female child for the father is characterized as Oedipus complex. You can find traces of it in different stories or novels that you read and it's used as a part of sexuality studies also. Apart from this, Freud talks in detail about sexuality where he talks about libido which is the energy associated with sexual drive. So there is the oral phase where a child from birth to one year of age gets pleasure from the mouth. The anal phase is between one to three years of age where the child learns to hold and let go of body waste. The 
phallic phase comes between three to five years where the child explores his, his or her own sexual organs. Between 8 to 11th year, you have the latency phase where the child is attracted to the parent of the opposite sex. And in adolescence, or the awakening of desire comes the genital phase. And then you have the entire concept of the rule of the father coming into form. And another thing that uh, Freud analyzed was dreams, which are, again, he says that it's real events or desires which take the formation of dreams. Now, literary works do not speak directly and explicitly, but they use images, symbols, emblems, and metaphors. And hence, they are, can be said, structured like, Dreams. Post Freud, we have Jacques Lacan, who recast the Freudian theory into a linguistic framework. He was influenced by Saussure as well as Roman Jacobson. He says that the unconscious is like language, meaning is a contrast between a word and another word. So there's no relation between the signifier and the signifies. So if you look at a word like toilet, so you have a signifier that is there in your mind. But if you see, the toilet is again, it has two signifiers. You have a toilet for ladies, you have a toilet for gentlemen. So both of them are different. Again, Lacan talks of the imaginary, where there is no distinction between the self and the other. That is the phase where the child is born. Then comes the mirror stage, where a child looks at himself or herself in the mirror and thinks that the, pers the reflection is another person. And this is where the child has started entering the language system. Learns about lack, separation, socialization, prohibitions as well as restraints. So this is the world of language or the world of symbols. So you have two basic concepts that you really need to remember with Lacan. That is the imaginary and the symbolic. And Lacanian critics favor anti-realist texts which challenge the conventions of realistic representation. And Lacan also talks about metaphor and metonymy, or condensation and displacement. Even Freud talks about the same. Uh, metonymy, if you remember, amongst your parts of speech you might have done for poetry is synecdoche. You use part for whole and whole for part. So metonymy is part for whole. So if I say, um, instead of referring to some American multimillionaire, I talk of the Mercedes and the BMW, that will be metonymy. And if I say something like, the ship plowed the waves. So you have two images. One is of the sea, the ship and the waves. The other is, the whole idea of plowing a field. That is where you have metaphor that is implied. And a philosophical orientation to psychoanalytic criticism came with the works of Carlson Guatri and Harold Bloom. Uh, next we come down is to Marxist literary theory. The basis is in the writings of Marx and Angels who talked about society, the conditions of production, and culture. And they said that the economic base influences the social superstructure. Marx's literary criticism basically believes that a writer's social class and his prevailing ideology have a major influence on what is written by a member of that class. That writers are formed by the social context, and also the form of the writings is influenced by society. Apart from Marx and Angels, they began, I mean, the whole idea of the theory began with them. But for our current study and influences, we have people like Althusser, Ucas, um, Gramsci. Althusser comes up with the entire concept of, I mean, goes very detailed into the concept of ideology. Ideology basically is a system of representation, be it ideas, myths, concepts, images, endowed with an existence and historical role at the heart of a given society. So in India, we have certain cultural connotations that most of us are brought with. And 
that kind of becomes our ideology and we kind of ingrain it within ourselves. Now, how is this ideology perpetuated in the system? So, Althusser talks about the institutionalized state apparatus and the repressive state apparatus. So, institutionalized state apparatus is your media, religion, family, art, school, and the repressive state apparatus is law courts, prison, police force, army. So, right now, say, we've been instructed to stay inside the homes. Now, how does the institutionalized state apparatus takes care of that? With this school is closed, you cannot go to the school or the college. The elders in the family will not let you go out. That is where institutionalization actually works. The repressive state apparatus is at the moment you know that if you go out, you might be first beaten up by the police and later on asked, why have you come out? The other concept that Althusser works with is hegemony. Hegemony is internalization of Force forms of social control, which makes certain views seem natural or invisible. And we take it just as they are. So when somebody says it is the job of women to cook and clean, and you do not question that, that is, you are hegemonizing the system. Or when you say, I am a boy, I will not even wash the glass from which I have drunk water, been hegemonized into a certain ideological system. Another word that I've used over here and is borrowed from Althusser is interpolates them as subjects of the system. So interpolation is a trick where we feel that we are choosing when we really have no choice. So when I tell you, you can have any chocolate that you like as long as it is a milk chocolate, produced in US. So say I've given you a choice and I've also not given you a or something like you can have any TV that you like. With Lukacs comes the idea of literary form as expressing a worldview that originates in economic and cultural relations and the writer's experience of these conditions. So if you are looking at works of say a writer like Prem Chand or Mulk Rajanan, this is where the Marxist theory would come into. Gramsci re redefines ideology where he emphasizes on institutional and cultural base and he says that it takes ideology is created through multiple forms like propaganda, sermons, folklore, popular songs and, and people are hegemonized whereby the dominant class maintain the position not by using force, but by symbolic actions. And Gramsci again talks of two types of individuals, the organic type and the traditional type. By organic type, he means those individuals who are likely to bring about changes in society. And the traditional types are the ones who would love to maintain the status quo without bringing any change. Williams talks about language as an activity and he emphasizes on the history of language and shows how meaning and values are embodied in language and change in language exerts an influence on social forces. For example, uh, a very small or insignificant, uh, it may sound, is the use of the honorific in our languages, which is kind of lessening as time passes by. So the kind of uh, like we would have, aap kar dijiega. Today, somebody would come out with a statement like aap kar do. Where kar do would be some, a verb which you would probably use uh, somebody who's junior to you in age. With somebody in senior in age or position, you would use the verb kar dijiega. When, meaning, when the val language changes, that kind of influences even the social forces and the minds of the people. So the questions that a Marxist who's interpreting literature would ask, what kind of values does a work reinforce? Socialist value, capitalist values. How does a text invite us to condemn oppressive and repressive ideologies? Again, is there any ideological conflict in the work? Then you have the new historicists. Um, 
In Britain, they are known as new historicists. In US, they are known as cultural materialists or cultural materialism. The term new historicism was coined by Stephen Greenblatt and his main innovation was to juxtapose the plays of the Renaissance with the horrifying colonial policies pursued by the major powers of the era. It is also influenced by the work of Foucault on discourse and the panoptic state. Discourse is not just a way of writing and speaking, but a whole ideology which encloses the thinking of all the members of a society. And Foucault again talks of the panoptic state. He goes back to Benetham's work on the panopticon, uh, where it's structured in such a way that all the prisoners are under surveillance. Similarly, the state is like the panoptic. It keeps all the citizens under surveillance, and especially with the use of smartphones, all of us are actually under surveillance. So you are parallelly reading literary and non-literary texts of the same historical period and critiquing it. Montrose combined the interest in the textuality of history and historicity of text. A very wonderful text which you might just like to read would be Kamleshwar's Kitne Pakistan. And also Sashi Tharu's The Great Indian Novel. So if you look at these texts and if you see how textuality, how history has been textualized and how the texts have been historicized, I mean, these two texts very clearly bring that to the forefront. Again, you defamiliarize the canonical literary text and see it as something new. And you also use certain aspects of post structuralist methodology. Feminism, one of the biggest and precisely a very interesting concept for uh, a lot of times. So we, e feminist criticism examines the way in which literature and other cultural productions reinforce or undermine the economic, political, social and psychological oppression of women. Patriarchy is by definition sexist promotes the belief that women are innately inferior to men and feminists distinguish between the two words sex and gender. Sex is a biological constitution whereas gender is, the cult is a cultural programming as a male or a female. While not all women may be born feminine, all men are not born masculine. And that is what we mean when we say it's a social construct. I do not apply a bindi. I do not put on sindoor. I do not wear bangles. That does not mean that I am not feminine. And similarly, I may have a husband who would love to help me out in the kitchen, do the dishes, even help me sweep and swap floors. It's not necessary that it, he is not masculine. These are all constructs within which we are kind of locked up and we really need to free ourselves. So a feminist criticism seeks to uncover the ideology of patri patriarchal society in works of literature and art and reads the representation of women. Now, some of the earliest works on feminism, if you notice, two names are of males. Mary Wollstonecraft who wrote A Vindication of the Rights of Women. John Stuart Mill, The Subjection of Women, Frederick Angels, The Origin of the Family. All the three wrote of the need to rethink the role of women and social oppression against them. In the 20th century, we come to Virginia Woolf, whose two texts, A, rooms of, A Room of One's Own and Three Guineas, laid down the gender biases and oppression that was there in pedagogic practices where say a university for male has more funds than a university founded for women. Simone de Beauvoir takes this to the next level in the second sex where she says a woman is not born but rather becomes a woman. So a girl child and a male child is born in the same way, has the same capabilities. But if you constantly tell the girl child you are a girl, you cannot do maths, 
you are a girl, you cannot do hard work. You are kind of, you begin the process of segregation and make the person actually into a girl or a boy. Uwe talks about women having been written out of history. She says that unlike other repressed groups, there is no historical record of women's shared culture, shared tradition and shared oppression. Kate Millett in her work Sexual Politics criticized the canonical male authors like Lawrence, Mailer, Miller and says the sexual relationship controlled by women by, sorry, by men reinforce gender oppression. Sexuality is a tool for patriarchal do domination. So a woman who kind of challenges patriarchy is called the unchaste woman. I mean, people uh, play negative claims onto her characters. And even violence is used to sustain stereotypes. That is, if you want patriarchy to be as it is, then you crush the voice of the women and the process of crushing involves a lot of violence. Judith Michel in Women's Estate links women's oppression to social structures like production, reproduction, sexuality as well as socialization. So your ability to produce monetary gain, your ability to reproduce children and that to male child. Uh, you do not have a control over your sexuality. Even in the process of socialization, you follow what the patriarchy has to say. A very big name in feminist criticism is Showalter. Who has, uh, I mean, two major volumes that you have is the new feminist criticism and speaking of gender. And she argues for female framework for the analysis of women's literature. She talks of three phases, the feminine phase, the feminist phase and the female phase. So the feminine phase was more like copying the male writers and what the men were doing. With the feminist phase, they came in the whole process of rebellion. And the female phase was more like searching for the women's voice rather than looking at what the men have to say about women. It is like what women have to say about themselves. Zadetsky talks about the socialist feminism, that is the issue of domestic labor and its role in capitalist economy. I was watching, a, I think it was a mini serial, or a, I just forget the, the name. So there's this woman, she's doing all the household work and everything, and uh, the people in the household say that, what is it that you are doing, be it the husband, the children, the in-laws. So one fine day, she tells her husband that she is going for a holiday all by herself. She's bought her ticket and that he need not worry. And so then the family members start making a list of the people they'll need, cooking, for cleaning and sweeping, for uh, the tuition of the children, everything. And then they start putting in like, okay, the cook is going to take this much of money. Uh, the tutor will take this much money. This one is going to take, the cleaner will take this much money. And when they start adding up, they realize how much money the woman was actually saving up. And like the husband had uh, uh, said, no, she used to run a small parlor. And the husband said that how much money does she get by making eyebrows? And she took it upon herself. And then he realized how much money she was actually saving the family. So there is this big issue of domestic labor in the household which goes unnoticed and unaccounted for. Liu Sidigare, Helen C uh, Siksu, they all talk about a women's language. They use the Lacanian idea that language is structured by the phallus. It is the male's language. The woman is at the margin. She is the other and so she needs a different language. And again, they played on Freud's notion where he said that women are incomprehensible, less moral and less rational than men. So they were like, why should we follow your language? We need a new language and women writers need a new language. So they went in and they said that okay, if the language is very flowery, if it is not so controlled like uh, or the structures are not controlled, let us look upon this as feminine language and we are not going to reject it. Even that needs appreciation. 
in continuation with this, we have actually, uh, I did not mention over here, but you have lesbian and gay criticism as well as queer theories. And together, all the four, that is feminism, lesbian and gay criticism and queer theory, follows the domain of what we call gender studies now. So, you, uh, there are, it's not that I as a mainstream writer is going to identify the lesbian and gay writers and establish their canon. But it is the lesbian and the gay or the queer writers who identify themselves, bring their episodes in the mainstream. And the foreground aspects and genres which were previously neglected or not talked about. Our biggest resource, post-colonial criticism. So you have post-colonial with the hyphen, without the hyphen. As I said, we do not have a mark. We cannot say that India became independent in 1947 and post-colonialism in India began in 1947. So when, I, when we use a term without a hyphen, we mean that it's moving parallelly. Two terms can move parallelly. Our background goes to works of writers like Fano, Edward Said, Homi Bhabha. Um, it emerged in the 1990s and has gained currency through the influence of works like Spivak's In Other Worlds, Ashcroft's The Empire Right Backs, Said's Orientalism and Culture, and uh, sorry, Orientalism and Culture and Imperialism. The whole idea is to challenge white Eurocentric norms and practices. Postcolonialism comes in or takes in four forms. So the first one is the colonized people find a voice and an identity to reclaim their past. The second is that you erode the colonialist ideology by which the past had been devalued. Number three is that you look at identity which can be hybrid, multiple, shifting. And the fourth part is we are looking at language. In what language are we writing? Whose language it is? So when we talk of cultural resistance and that we need to find a voice and an identity to reclaim one's own past. So you go back to, say, historical figures. You go back to your uh, the civilization's history. And you use that to challenge the Western or the Occidental perspective that you had. When we talk about eroding the colonialist ideology by which the past had been devalued. So like in the case of India, where uh, Indian texts, Indian languages were rejected and the British education system was imposed. And then writers, uh, I mean, uh, people like uh, uh, Pandit, uh, sorry, Rana Day, Gokhale, they started going back to Shivaji and to say the celebration of the Ganesha festival in order to get the inspiration to challenge the British. Then if you look at the works of writers like Yates or Achibi, so they have like Achibi was Western educated but writing about Africa. So you have the hybrid identity or that multiple identity is there. Yeats wrote about Ireland, but he was a Catholic and you have the Protestants in Ireland. Uh, uh, sorry, uh, he was a Protestant, you have the Catholics in Ireland and the whole challenges that came up there. So those, ident those conflicting identities and multiple identities are always there. And again, the whole idea is that in which language do you write? Would you write in your own mother tongue? How would you challenge? Uh, I mean, people still wrote in English because they would get a larger audience. And uh, one of the finest examples of uh, this whole language debate is Sujata Bhatt's poem, Search for My Tongue, where the first and the last section is written in English and the middle section is written in uh, Gujarati. So, <clears throat> Then we come to Homi Bhabha, who gives the whole concept of mimicry, where he says that in the newly independent nations, people try to mimic or copy the colonized powers, and hence those nations were not able to do what they had actually planned to do or would have 
done. And then uh, there's this whole idea of rejecting the Western claim of universalism or the universal truth. We start representing other cultures, start questioning cultural difference, and we are celebrating our hybridity that our, and our cultural polyvency. That is cultural, um, could call it multilingualism or multiplicities that we have, plurality that we have. So basically, literary, th uh, I've actually not dealt with a couple of things that is modernism and postmodernism and new criticism for want of time. But the whole idea is your one question could be why should we actually study theory? Why do we need to study theory? Weren't people like Philip Sidney, Johnson, Dryden, Eliot enough for us? No, they were not enough for us. Because number one, all those viewpoints were again Eurocentric viewpoints. The representation of texts that they studied were all Western texts. You do not uh, get any multiple voices. Literary theory adds to our critical capabilities. It shows us the different ways in which we can read and reread texts and other cultural artifacts, be it cinema, advertisements, posters. It broadens our mental vision and horizon. And it is a need of the hour in present times where we need to challenge many constructs for the development of society. My only advice, request would be for you to is read, read and read, but read things against the grain. Against the grain meaning that a first instance of reading gives you a particular meaning of the text. Try to do away with that meaning, look for new meaning, try and create that multiplicity or plurality of meanings. That is what reading against the grain actually. Thank you. There's one question coming from Smriti uh, and uh, she asked that is interpolation similar to the Hegelian tra tragedy? So interpolation is uh, basically you are kind of uh, drawn into something and you feel that you are being given a choice where if you look deeper into it, you actually do not have a choice. For example, um, say when uh, parents select brides or grooms for us, they come down to the final one or two and then they tell you, okay, these are the qualities of this one, good family, good job, good income, good looks, well-matched horoscope. On the other hand, you have the second one, and now you choose from amongst one. So you have a choice and you also do not have a, so you are just hanging somewhere in the middle. There's one request uh, again coming from Smriti itself that she wants you to explain modernism in brief. If you see uh, till the end of the 19th century, the kind of novels that were written, say by people like Dickens or even by George Eliot and the kind of prose, uh, sorry, the work of poetry that we had. So suddenly, like in the beginning of the 20th century, you have this entire desire of breaking away from the past. People did not want to write as people before them had been writing. It is this break from the past which is categorized or has been called as modernism. Uh, so you have somebody like, say, E. E. Q. Ming. He would sign his name even in that would be in small letters. Uh, he he would not write capital uh, letters. It would be all small. So that was what uh, modernism actually did. And there are different parts of modernism. So when you have uh, talking of the various schools of painting, the symbolists, the images, expressionism. Surrealism, Dadaism, all that comes under modernism. So that was precisely one reason why I kind of did not take up the term because taking up modernism would have meant going into all these things. And postmodernism is when you are uh, looking at things like uh, uh, intertextuality, 
you are looking at the unreliability of the narrator, you are looking at uh, the historical and political thematic issues, all that comes under postmodernism. So people like uh, Thomas Pynchon, they are all postmodernist writers. Uh -huh.